Well, these past weeks uh, we have been uh, studying, learning a bit from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, as uh, Luke has given those Acts to us. And uh, this morning we're in this chapter, Acts 6, verses 1 to 7. The next two weeks we're going to step back uh, to Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. And our theme for the next two weeks is, you know, sharing the blessing. And it has to do uh, with this season and time of stewardship in our lives. And trying to align our lives and, and the way we live our lives and manage our lives and all that we have and all that we are uh, with God's word and the expectations that, that God has for us, which are always good. God works together all things for good to those that love him. Today, we're, we're talking about this interesting topic of a healthy church. Let me ask you here, have any of you ever failed at anything? Raise your hand, because if you're not raising your hand, wow, we have to t follow that person. <laughs> Every one of us here from time to time, we've made mistakes. We've failed at something as we've gone along. I mean, when is the last time you failed? And if you don't know, then ask the person sitting next to you. <laughs> Maybe... Maybe ask your spouse, because I'm sure your spouse will have all kinds of illustrations of when we fail. It's like starting a conversation. You know, my mother, who's been deceased for some time, she was an alcoholic much of her life. And there was that period of time in her life when she would introduce herself that way. My name is Donna Utek, and I'm an alcoholic. It got me to thinking about how many times have I ever walked up to somebody and said, hi, my name is Jeff Utek and I'm a failure. We, we don't do that kind of stuff, do we? You ever see people who uh, write on Facebook or on their Twitter accounts, hello, I'm a failure. But we're pretty quick to say that of others. We, we generally don't want to tell people about our mistakes and our shortcomings. We're more likely to speak about our victories and the things we do right and well than the things we do wrong or poorly. But I think we can all agree today that, you know, we do fail. We do make mistakes. Things don't always work out the way that we had hoped they would. So the question is, what do we do in response? And that's the question we come to today when we look at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. This is the big idea today because it's really about how those, uh, uh, those 12 disciples, those 12 apostles, respond to how they had failed in meeting the needs of the widows. So early in the book of Acts, we uh, have learned a lot about Jesus, and we have learned about Jesus primarily through preaching. Uh, Peter has been preaching day after day after day uh, around the, the courts there in, in the uh, Jerusalem temple. He has been teaching that, that Jesus, you know, lived without sin, that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, that Jesus uh, rose from death as our Savior, that Jesus has ascended on high into heaven as our Lord and King of kings, and that Jesus himself said, and now you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. And Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit came and the church, the body of Christ, came into being and became defined and a whole new uh, organism and sort of institution today uh, has come about thousands. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine, but thousands became followers of Jesus in a matter of months. It was unbelievable revival that broke out. Over 20,000 men, women, and children were added to the number of Christ followers in Jerusalem with, within months, one-fifth of the population. Of course, we don't know to what degree, you know, they, they were following Jesus, but they were following. They were a part of this movement. They, they were hungering for something more. And, and many, many, many received the unstoppable power of the Holy Spirit so that they could live by the same power that Jesus was living by. And they could march forward to be his witnesses in the power of that spirit. And it's all recorded here in the book of Acts. The church growing, thriving, winning, succeeding, if you want to use that word. But then we come to the end of uh, Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> And we discover that uh, the early believers are now experiencing persecution. 
and leaders are being imprisoned. They're being, they're being beaten and imprisoned for their faith. And the early church now is experiencing the power of the authorities to try and muzzle their witness and to prevent the testimony of who Jesus is from being shared. So in addition to the outside forces of persecution, this week in Acts chapter 6, we learned that the church was also experiencing an internal kind of resistance, an internal struggle, maybe even opposition. So you get two forces that are coming together here in the early days of the formation and the growth of the church of Jesus Christ. You've got external persecution and then you have internal opposition and struggle. In Acts 6, the struggle is around a, a failure. Now, up to this point, we've seen the church in Acts have a lot of what we would call wins. Preaching is going on every day, and people are being won to Christ. Uh, there's teaching going on, and that's a win. There's evangelism going on where, where disciples and apostles and followers are telling their neighbors and others about, about their experiencing of Jesus or their experience of the Holy Spirit or their experience of what it is to be in this new community. And, and evangelism, the sharing of faith, is happening and there are winds. And, the, and churches and groupings of people in, in homes are, are being planted and, and there are winds going on there. Baptisms are happening. That's a win. People are being converted. It's amazing. At the end of the scripture reading today, did you see where it said priests were also following Jesus? There's Jewish conversions going on. All these ways that the church is winning in, in Acts 4 that we'll talk about the next two weeks. There was incredible generosity going on, extravagant giving and sharing of the blessings that God has provided. <clears throat> but now, there's struggle internally. <clears throat> there's kind of a loss going on. And so in Acts 6, verse 1, <clears throat> excuse me. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number. Isn't that neat? The church is growing. It says that the Greek Jews, also called Hellenist Jews complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So the church early on is not just ministering to the spiritual needs of the people. It's not just about preaching and teaching and healing and evangelism, but it's also about meeting the physical needs of people because God cares for the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. That being said, the leaders are doing the best they can to meet these physical needs, but there's just too many. I mean, there's such an explosion of people who are joining the movement and getting into community here that the, the leadership cannot, of themselves, meet all the physical needs. They simply are failing at it. So here's the situation. Verse 1 talks about the widows. Now, <clears throat> in that day, it was a little bit different than our time. Because typically then, <clears throat> a woman was uneducated. I mean, they didn't have school like we do. She didn't go to high school or to college or, or to graduate school. She, she was not a career-oriented person. Uh, she did not have a retirement plan or 401k. She did not possess life insurance or disability insurance. And the social service net of the government, government really wasn't in existence for her. None of those things existed. Usually, a young woman at age 14, 15, or 16 would hope to be married at that, at that time. And her husband would be the head of the household, and he would have legal authority over everything. And she would have no authority legally. The property would be in his name. And it was he who would take care of her. Now, if he would die, that would leave her in an extremely vulnerable uh, situation. It would be her children, particularly 
her sons who would be expected to step in and to love and to serve and to help and to look after the mom. And if there were no children to help out, then other extended family or relatives, it would be expected that they would step up and they would be the ones to uh, take care of her. But what if she didn't have any of that? Or what if her, her children and relatives would have nothing to do with her? And, and so they would fail in their responsibility or, or maybe there was just nothing available at all. Clearly, she would be left in the most vulnerable position. So the church decided there are these occasions where we have got to step in and help. We've got to help these godly widows so that even though they don't have any means of income or support, their needs will be taken care of. And there just were too many. And so they were failing at something they wanted to do a good job at, but they were failing. So the conflict is that these widows are supposed to be receiving help, and the Hebrew-speaking Jewish widows are getting better help than the Greek-speaking Jewish widows. Now, for most of us, those categories might not have a lot of meaning, but they are actually distinct racial, ethnic, cultural kind of groupings. I mean, the Roman government had been in control. They'd they'd been in rule for a long time. There had been persecution and opposition uh, amongst the Jewish people. So for some of them, for some of God's people, they decided that that they were going to dig in. And they would kind of set themselves, both figuratively and literally, near the temple. They were going to stay with the system as it was. Dedicated to the the synagogue way. And they would only speak their Hebrew language. And they would only deal with Old Testament traditions and laws. They, They would be hardcore. They'd be steadfast. They would be devout. They were in it for the Lord and they were not going to waver. But others moved away from that system and became assimilated into the wider culture. And so they picked up the Greek language, the Greek culture, and they were called a Grecian Jews, or another word that we saw on screen was Hellenist or Hellenistic Jews. I sort of think of it this way. The, the Hebra- Hebraic Jews, we might call conservatives in our language, You know, they were the traditionalists, the purists. And then, uh, that would be the Hebraic Jews. But then you had the Greek-speaking, these Hellenist Jews. Maybe we'd call them the progressives or the more liberal wing, as it were. And so here's what happens so timely during our election season. (laughs) Jesus loves both. If you're Republican, he loves you. If you're a Democrat... Jesus loves you. And if you're somewhere in between or outside, you know, way to the extremes, Jesus loves you. But you see, when it comes to Jesus and to God, what he wants from us first and foremost is to love him. Our whole heart, soul, mind, strength, all of it to be given to him and to follow him. And out of that relationship to love one another. And so what we've got going on here is we've got Hebraic Jews and Grecian Jews and and they all become Christians. The right and the left. And the middle. And the extremes. And guess what? They're in church together. And there's racial and cultural and ethnic conflict, and they're not getting along all that well. They're not rowing in the same boat just yet, and they're, they're having to work some stuff out. And the Hebrew widows, you know, they, they appear on the scene, they get first-class treatment. And you know how it goes when one group in the church gets first-class treatment and all the other groups perceive that they're not getting the same treatment? Why do these people get more than we do? Why do they get better funding than we do? 
Why do these people get more food, more money, more love, more support, more, more help than these people? Now, remember, these are vulnerable, perhaps abandoned women. And it, it's racial, it's cultural, and, and it's tense. It's, it's a highly charged thing. So the disciples have kind of a, a predicament here, don't they? What are they going to do? That's our context. And out of that context, I want to make some observations and then kind of paint a picture of the life cycle of, of a church. Uh, first observation, and, and it's simple, but it's true, so important. Jesus is happy when a church grows. I hope you know that. Jesus is happy. He loves it. He's overjoyed when a church grows. Scripture says, now in these days, the disciples were increasing in numbers. And do you know what that means? It means somebody was taking attendance. Somebody was paying attention to who's showing up. Numbers matter to God because a number refers to a person who is being saved and welcomed into the kingdom of God. We count people because people count. And Jesus is happy about that. And Jesus would love it if there were a whole lot more people right here to be counted. It's a good thing when people become Christians. It's a good thing when a church grows and when the people of God go out into the community, invite others into this followership. So a growing church is a healthy church. A growing church is a healthy church. Second observation, as a church is growing, though Jesus is happy, not everybody else in the church is. Have you ever experienced that? When a church grows, some people don't like it. There's almost always a complaint. Things are changing. I don't like the way that's being done. I used to be able to park my camel right over here, but now I have to park my camel way over there. Because all the new people are using up my camel space. Or, boy, I sure wish the coffee wasn't so diluted. <laughs> you find things like that, don't you? The little things. I used to be able to sit up here, but, but now all the guests and visitors have taken my seat and my row. My place is no more. It's just horrible. It's just horrible the way the church is changing. Not everybody's happy when the church grows and things change. Because not everybody likes change. But Jesus loves a growing church. And thus change is bound to happen. Third observation, even good churches fail. Even good churches not only fail in little ministries from time to time, but as a whole unit, as a whole organization, might find itself in a declining time. The apostles had failed a little bit here. They, you know, these are the same guys that were chosen by Jesus. Think about this. These were the guys. They knew the truth. They had good doctrine. They worked hard. They loved people. They were very prayerful. They didn't steal anything. They weren't racist bigots. But they failed early on in trying to meet all the needs of these people. And so now they're coming together to find a way to fix it. So it's important to just realize that as growth happens, as change happens, there's going to be some upset. There's going to be some chaos. There's going to be some people who say, what about me? And it'll feel like there's failure going on. Coon Rapids Church, do we have failings here? Yeah, we do. But let's look at this from an organizational viewpoint. When a church like this is smaller, maybe it's 100 people or, or 200 members, then the clergy and the leadership, they're like generalists. They're expected to do everything, be everywhere, pray at all things, you know. And, and, and so there's that, that broad leadership that takes place. And generally, people are pretty happy and needs are being met. But as an organization grows and numbers are being added and it gets larger and larger, it has to evolve as a system 
in order to provide the kinds of ministries that will meet the felt needs of its people as well as bring in new people into the kingdom of God. And so we have to become like a team of specialists and not just in the, in the sense of a large team, but in then smaller teams and smaller teams. And it just keeps evolving. And that's, that's what's happening here in the, in the scripture today. So early on, you see in this fledgling church, the 12 apostles, they were doing everything. I mean, they, these were the guys that were, you know, they were cutting the vegetables, they were, they were making the stew, they were serving like waiters. But they were also studying and praying and preaching and teaching and counseling and healing. And the church had gotten bigger and it was exploding. And they had to find a way to organize and reorganize so that the preachers could preach and the teachers could teach and the prayers could pray and the waiters could wait on tables and the cooks could do the meals. And so the church needs to become a team of specialists. Well, people, like I was saying in the children's talk, people use the abilities God has blessed them with for the ministry of the word in the meeting of needs. So the apostles say something to the effect, we're just not going to wait on tables anymore because sometimes the preacher isn't as good at one thing and not so good at another. And I think after 10 months being here, you've gotten the idea that I'm good at some things and not so good at others, wouldn't you say? We're good at this, but not so good at that. So we'll do what we're good at, and we'll find some people to do what they're good at. And everybody finds that niche, that place, where they're able to just joyfully share the blessing of what God has given them to the glory of God. And so my role as the interim transitional pastor here at Coon Rapids Church, you know, my role is primarily that of a preacher, an evaluator, and a coach. I'm here to help you as a congregation find a new way, see a new way, or make adjustments to the existing way that will allow the church to get back on a a trajectory of growth again, of sharing the blessing of ministry and of life and of being a follower of Jesus, sharing all of that just for the sheer joy of it. Your role is to be the minister's. You are the body of Christ, the priesthood of all believers. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for you to do. Do you pray that God would reveal that to you? Your role as a minister, it may include the specialties of technology or music or drama or caregiving, of finance, of property maintenance, of program ideas of leading, of cooking, greeting, praying, on and on it goes, but it's all about sharing the blessing that God has provided each of us to do. We are in this together as a team of specialists. Observation number four, every failure is a Holy Spirit opportunity. At uh, verse three, therefore pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Just by the way, I didn't say this at the earlier hour, but but this is a good template. When leaders are chosen to lead, they should be people full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. People who have truly given their lives over to Christ and the unstoppable power of the Spirit. Those, those need to be our leaders. But anyway, the apostles, the primary leaders, they're, they're not good at some things. And that is what gives way to the Holy Spirit, this opportunity to create ministry areas or ministry teams where new people with different gifts can step forward and, and use a new way to meet the felt needs of people. This is a good thing. They create a new office, if we could maybe use that language. They say we need a new uh, leader team, or we need a, a new group of ministry people over here, or we need a different kind of leader over here. We need a new way of doing things over here because the needs are changing with the numbers of people joining. And so they reorganized. They changed the system from that of being generalists to being specialists, And that is how ministry would then unfold. You do this, I'll do that. 
Here are some generalists, but here are some specialists. And there's a lesson in this for us. A healthy church continually changes. It's con or maybe a better way, if you don't like the word change, a healthy church is always looking to improve. I, I hope you agree with that. We want to always be improving upon what we're doing and, and who we are, both with our, our inner life and then the life of the organization itself so that we can better meet the needs of people and fulfill the mission of reaching new people for Jesus Christ. So what I want you to grasp and to take as a cue uh, as we move forward here at this church uh, in this time of transition is that there are normal rhythms and life cycles, of course there are, to churches and to organizations. Even families go through growth cycles, don't we? You get married, you have kids, your kids grow, they grow up, they leave, you're just gonna enter a whole new season of life. Then you have all the challenges that go on in the midst of that, of, of financial challenges and illnesses and job changes and, and moving here and there. All of that is a part of the cycle of what goes on in a system where people are working together towards a common good. And so the same thing happens as a church. So I want to give you, uh, kind of right out of uh, chap chapter 6, what I would call the spirit-empowered church cycle. And this is the, the, the life cycle of a church, as is, is I would think it would be in a very broad kind of description and very fast, okay? So here it goes. Number one, preach Jesus. Right out of the gate, the Holy Spirit is given the Holy Spirit is unleashed. Pentecost happens. And, what hap and then what? Peter stands up and starts preaching. This guy who at one time was a failure is now standing up before the masses and he's preaching. And he continues to preach. He heals, he preaches. He heals, he preaches. Day after day after day. And Christianity is growing. Peter and John and others are preaching. It all comes down to Jesus. Just keep talking about Jesus and healing and ministering in the name of Jesus. The apostles in Acts 6 remind us that the preaching, the proclaiming, the proclamation of the word is number one. Number one. It's front and center. Always, always, always in the life of the church. Preaching, proclaiming the good news of Jesus is paramount in the life of the church. Number two, the church will grow. Because if the word is being properly proclaimed in spirit and in truth, and when I say that, I don't just mean but from the pulpit. I mean from you all, the ministers. If you're in the world witnessing to this spirit and this truth and to the word that is being preached, the church will grow. Others will come to Christ. People will see that, that that's an amazing thing going on in your life and in the life of a congregation. And people will flock to that and they will, they will be like a magnet to it, drawn to it, and people become Christians and the church grows. But then what happens? I'll tell you what. As growth happens, just give it enough time and number three will occur. There will be trouble. There will be unhappiness. There will be discord among the members. That's just part of what organizations go through as, as they grow. But then comes number four. If a church is on top of its game, like any organization, it will reorganize, it will reassess, it will revision, and thus redeploy new leadership, fix its failures, and by the grace of God, go on to win more people to Jesus. Success occurs when the people recommit to the mission and the ministry and do whatever it takes to accomplish what God calls them to do. And then that brings us to step five, keep preaching Jesus. Keep talking about Jesus. Keep healing in Jesus' name. Keep doing compassionate service in Jesus' name and maintain Jesus as the center of everything. And then step number six, repeat steps one through five. And that's what I would call the spirit-empowered life cycle of a church. 
And the fact is where we are today, you know, we're, we're probably at that, that over the top. You know, we've, we've had years where this church has been growing. It's kind of like one of those bell, bell curves. You know, we, we were up here. We were up here for quite a long, long time, five, maybe 10 years. We had reached a point, but we've now come down that bell curve. And, and as a church, we're, in, we're declining. And, and now we need to reassess. We need to revision, redeploy new leadership, fix some of our fails, and by the grace of God, start winning again. If you just think organizationally. And that's going to be part of the work of this congregation for the next two, three, four years. Uh, as you recommit to the mission and ministry of the church, embrace a new person and get back to preaching, talking about, and serving in Jesus' name. Friends, this is not just the, the cycle of church life. This is the cycle of, of your life. You meet Jesus. You learn about Jesus. You grow in Jesus. And then if you're anything like me, there are days you fail Jesus. And, and when you fail Jesus, there are some people who notice and they become unhappy with you. And, 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 and there's a confrontation perhaps. And, and you repent. And, and you ask God to forgive your mistakes. And by the grace of God, you, you pick yourself up and you start walking with Jesus again. And then you grow some more. And you keep on growing. Until someday when maybe you fail again. And you go through that cycle. But in all things, we give grace to one another. And we give grace to the whole church. And we do it in Jesus' name. That's how to be a healthy church. Let's pray. God, we thank you, as we always do, first and foremost, for who you are and for your son, Jesus, your graceful gift to us. And for that grace, which is mercy, it's undeserved, but we, it's there and we are so thankful for your love. God, we thank you that in the cycles of our own lives where, where we've had exciting times of growth and, and, and a sense of, of succeeding in our spiritual lives and happiness and joy, and, but then we know there's down times and, and times of struggle and, and failure and doubt. And, and we thank you that in those times your forgiveness is real. And you call us back to yourself and, and your spirit re-energizes us and that new creation takes hold again and, and we feel ourselves moving upward ever closer to you and to your heart. And we know, God, it's that way with the church. It's that way with us as the whole body of Christ. And so we're praying for a, a, a renewal and in some cases revival, but for a newness of life and of joy and, and of expectation perhaps even change, but certainly how can we grow and be your faithful, hopeful, loving followers? This is what we are praying for so that throughout your body there will be health and goodness and grace for all. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.